First of all, many thanks to Emin and her team for inviting me to deliver this presentation. I would have preferred to come to Istanbul, but things are what they are, and well, let's now hope for a brighter future. So the next 20 or so minutes, we'll be looking into the following question. When we think of translation as a mosaic, then how precisely do we conceive of translation? I will try to answer that question uh, by discussing the following steps. First, we'll have a look at some of the common metaphors of translation and the ways in which translation is generally conceptualized through such metaphors. Then we'll look into the conceptual elements involved in the idea of mosaic while comparing these to what the more common metaphors imply. Third, I'll discuss how language can be seen as a mosaic before moving on to translation as a mosaic. I'll discuss language first, because translation is a certain use of language, and therefore the way we conceive of language inevitably influences the way we see translation. After that, I'll apply the concept of translation as mosaic to an example, and we'll end with a brief discussion. So first, let's have a look at existing metaphors of translation. Lakoff and Johnson have shown in Metaphors We Live By that metaphors are more than just ornaments. We use them as tools to conceptualize reality, as basic templates, so to say, that help us understand the world around us. We've all seen such metaphors proliferate over the last year or year and a half or so with regard to the pandemic. There have been metaphors of war, disaster, bubbles, waves, domino effects, curves to be flattened, fires to be extinguished, and so on. Now, such metaphors have also been used to think translation throughout history. I've just mentioned a few examples here. There are many, many more, as was shown by Lefebvre, Bilst, Fenuti, Ballard, among others. Such conceptual metaphors are also present in translation studies as a discipline and have received quite a bit of attention. I'll just single out an early article by Lieven Dulst in Target in 92, in which he argues that such metaphors are not remains of some kind of pre-scientific thought. Rather, they are inevitable. They cannot be replaced by literal expressions. So metaphors are there and they are there to stay and they are there to help us understand the phenomenon of translation. However, it's important to say that no metaphor is innocent because it always conceives and presents translation in a certain way. So let us first look into that. What are the conceptual implications of some of the more common metaphors of translation in translation studies? There are many metaphors in translation studies. For instance, source and target, source et cible, literal versus free translation as well, foreignization versus domestication, and that's Fenuti, or also translation as a bridge, an encounter, a prism, or a transfer between here and there, between the foreign and the self. Arguably, such metaphors share some common conceptual features. First, they are binary or dichotomic in the way in which translation is presented. There is a versus or a between involved in each of them. As a result, the underlying principle is that of exclusion, of either or reasoning. The translation is either this or that. Third, such metaphors are directional. There is a from to movement in pi. And this directionality is often expressed through spatial metaphors. Such spatial representations, as a bridge, for instance, can be traced back to the Latin etymology of translation, that is, transducere, uh, to bring across. And this is interpreted as across a frontier, a bridge, a prism, as across space. Fourth, dichotomic and exclusive either or reasoning causes frictions. Frictions with regard to the idea of equivalence, equivalence, which presupposes some kind of the same. As a result, translation is often seen as an endeavor to recreate sameness, although there is difference. Finally, these metaphors focus on what is brought across, that is content or meaning and form or style, which are seen as derivative, as coming from a source text 
and being or not being brought across in a target text. However, translations happen in a single culture, which is the translating culture. It is there that translations are initiated, made, sold, and read. So why do we emphasize dichotomy and directionality, starting from the translated culture, which actually remains passive and undergoes translation? Put otherwise, transducere, to bring across, does not have to be across space. The, the expression also has an epistemological meaning which is to bring something across, to make it understandable. And this is something that happens inside the translating culture. Other metaphors may be possible and might avoid such dichotomic and directional thinking. And mosaic may well be one of these. So let's look at mosaic. Let's start from a simple definition, which is the one I found on Wikipedia, exactly as our students do. What are the conceptual implications of this definition and how do they compare to what we saw for other metaphors of translation? A mosaic is a puzzle of pieces put together in a layer or plaster of plaster or mortar. As such, it suggests the idea of inclusion rather than exclusion and and rather than either or, one thing being embedded in the other. Also, the mosaic is a work of art, and this implies an artist, a creator in his or her own right, rather than the directional or derivative bringing across we saw before. The mosaic also implies a certain ambivalence rather than equivalence, something becoming something else as the result of a creative process. Finally, Focus here is not on content and form alone being brought across, but on the material used to create new content and form. So yes, the metaphor of mosaic does seem to hold a number of ideas that are different from what is implied by usual metaphors of translation. But before looking at translation as a mosaic, let's have a look first at language. There is indeed a way of grounding the concept of translation as mosaic in a concept of language as mosaic. This concept or epistemology of language is or could be Michael Bakhtin's dialogism. According to Bakhtin, the use of language always is two things at the same time, for which he uses two meanings of a Russian word, sobitye, which means an event, but also literally an aggregate of beings, coexistence, togetherness. According to this theory, every utterance is a new event of discourse, but it also is coexistence. An utterance always exists together with other utterances within the variety of social discourses. That is what Bakhtin calls heterology. That coexistence literally is togetherness, that is, utterances or texts intermingle, echo each other, reuse previous utterances and in turn are reused in other new utterances. Because new utterances always echo existing utterances or texts that can be incorporated, changed, parodied, adapted, or also ignored, which is a way of reacting to them as well, Language always is togetherness. It always implies the other's voice. Any utterance or text therefore is on the border of at least two voices, two consciences, one being the creative one, the other one being echoed, being reused. Finally, <clears throat> in this process of dialogic interaction, any new utterance or text creates a new form represented here by a red balloon. However, this new form reuses and includes previous utterances. In that process of dialogic reuse, these utterances have become material, represented here by the blue balloon, included in the new utterance. This is why we can say that every utterance or text is a new mosaic, 
a new form consisting of parts of mosaic stones of language used before and will in turn be reused as material in yet another mosaic, another new utterance, another new form. So yes, dialogism does indeed present language as a mosaic. It shows the same conceptual elements as the ones we saw before. Consequently, we can consider languages and cultures as surfaces layered with pieces of previous utterances. As a result, languages or texts are all about inclusion and coexistence about materials integrated in a form so that a text is and material and form, one in the other rather than one or the other. That new form is a new event, thus implies a creator in his or her own right. Yet by this event, existing materials previously made by other creators are being reused so that new utterances or texts become materials reused to create other new utterances or texts. Now, can we apply this to translation as well? The answer is yes, because translation is language and because in translation, the linguistic material is reused and put into a new linguistic form. So starting from the same elements of conceptualization implied by mosaic and by a dialogic conception of language, we can see translation as a cultural surface layered with utterances and texts puzzled together from previous materials. Each translation being a new layer, a new plaster of language, including such materials in order to create a new form so that translations are indeed newly created events by which a creator reuses in various ways, various materials, the text he or she is translating, but also other texts the translator may have read, people he or she may have spoken to, earlier translations that may exist and that can all be material to the translator creator. So that translations reuse materials that stem from both the so-called source and target languages and contexts, and in turn become material to other newly created translations. These elements could be addressed in translation studies as follows. The surface of culture involves cultural strategies, such as adaptation, historization, conventionalization, and so on. The plaster or mortar of language involves linguistic translation strategies, such as standardizations, explicitations, reuse or not of heterology, cohesion. The pieces of stone embedded in that mortar could be the elements of content and form integrated in a translation and priorities applied to these elements. The pattern that so emerges in terms of content, style, narrative, and so on, is created by the use of translation strategies and techniques. And the final image would be the interpretation of the text in translation. That is how character psychology, narrative tension, thematic coherence, stylistic features, and so on, were interpreted and included in the form of the translation. As a result, Translation is not presented as exclusion or as an either or type of product, but as inclusion, as materials embedded in a new form, as an and and product. Translation then is a dialogic response to those materials that occurs in the translating culture, but can comprise both so-called source and target elements and voices. And translation therefore is creative. It is a newly created text in which material and form coexist and no longer a form of directional or derivative rewriting. Let us take a concrete example. Uh, I did something wrong there. Never mind. Let us take a concrete example. There it is. There we go. My example are basically two very short sentences. The example is taken from the 14th chapter of Ulysses, in which Joyce counts the story of a birth. 
while using a series of stylistic parodies of English literature in its subsequent stages, starting from Latin over primitive speech, medieval poetry, 16th century rhetoric, and so on, all the way to contemporary Irish slang in a Dublin pub. This example is an early one. It imitates the style of an early state, which is Anglo-Saxon monosyllabic alliterative prose. The material that is in there for the translator to interact with and to integrate in a new form is incredibly rich. There are elements of content. The key ones given the story of birth and development of the English language or a baby still in the womb. The syntax is quite particular as it imitates Old English. So it shows high levels of historical heterology in Bakhtin's terms. Eh? Articles are missing. There are postpositions of subjects and verbs and so on. At the level of lexis, there is the use of many monosyllables of babe instead of baby and the choice of the word bliss. And there is, of course, rhythm and prosody. Alliterations, four Bs in the first sentence, then four Ws in the second one. Two short sentences of equal length and metrical foot, starting with anapests. Now, let's look at the Dutch translations of this passage. Don't panic, I've provided glosses in English. This is uh, how the first translator has translated these two sentences. I can't go into every detail, but the main observations would be the following. In the first translation, the word borderling is used, which actually means a newly born, although we are before birth. Further, there is syntactical standardization, for instance, by putting the grammatical subject borderling first, or by postponing the adverbial clause in the second sentence, uh, which distorts the parallelism before born within room. Bliss has been explicitated into a blessed feeling possessed. Historical heterology has disappeared except for one single old Dutch uh, word. And prosody finally is somewhat irregular. There are alliterations on B and W, but also on G and C. And the parallelism of two sentences suffers from long words, explicitations and standardizations that make the sentences longer. In the second translation, the translators have reused the key words, borderling and schot. So those are mosaic stones that come from the first translation, which also is a source material to the retranslators, although it is a target text. This translation also is standardizing in its lexis, which is modern Dutch. There is no heterology at all. There is a lot of explicitation regarding the idea of security, shelter, or protection, which is absent from the Joyce material. And finally, prosody is more regular with four alliterations on B in the first sentence and then four on the palatal sound, although there are two Bs in the second sentence as well. The third and final translation, this is the third one that has been made rather recently. The idea of schuld here is reused once more. So we have a mosaic stone coming from the second translation, which had already reused it from the first translation. But the idea of the newly born is replaced with another word, namely pop, which means a doll. This is a very heterologic choice. The Oxford English Dictionary mentions a second meaning for the Middle English word babe, which is precisely a rag doll, a doll. There is another heterologic, so old Dutch word in there, which is schut, that's not modern Dutch. This is a heterologic version of shelter, the schutting in the previous translation, reused, but it has become, instead of explicitating, it is now turned into heterology, and that's a polemical choice. Syntax is now more heterologic as well. Instead of standardizing, Syntax follows word order of the material. First, the adverbial clauses and then subjects and verbs. More monosyllables were used as well. The sentences are therefore much shorter and show the exact same number of syllables, seven, as in Joyce's material. As for prosody, both sentences start with anapests and the alliterations are regular and were reused in the second sentence from the second translation. 
These differences can be described in terms of the mosaic concept. First, the very rich materials or mosaic stones are incorporated and distributed in these translations with other priorities, while materials from earlier translations are also being reused. So source materials also include target texts. The language, the mortar if you prefer, is different in terms of standardization and heterology. As for culture, the surface, the first translations are conventionalized. They adapt the material to what uh, Gideon Turi called an institutionalized repertoire of possibilities in Dutch literary translation. The last translation doesn't do that. So the pattern that emerges, translation strategies and techniques is different as well. There is a lot of explicitation in the first translations, but not in the last one, which uses more word for word translation. Finally, the interpretation, the image that emerges from these translations Although, of course, we shouldn't generalize from a single passage, but my comments go actually for many, many other examples as well in those uh, translations. The image is that of different choices, different interpretations, and different ideas also of what it means to be faithful in translation. There are many, many more different renderings of that material in different forms and shades and colors and layers of language. And all of these existing translations bring an incredible variety of interpretations, of views on, of dialogic responses to, that can be seen as pieces in a huge mosaic of translation. Such a mosaic of translational or maybe transnational choice is really a mind blowing galaxy of possibilities that enriches the original in multiple ways, giving it birth in a multitude of languages and cultures to whom without translations, Ulysses would not be a living book, but a dead object. Let's conclude. Conceptualizing translation as a mosaic, I think can indeed be useful. It points to and perhaps allows to overcome some of the conceptual pitfalls we're all struggling with, such as dichotomies, directionality, and translation as indirect derivative writing. It can also be a means of stressing the creative component of translation by looking at it in a more inclusive manner and seeing it as a newly created form that includes materials coming, coming from the text that is translated, but also, as we saw, from other sources such as previous translations. It also allows for a language integrated epistemology of translation and the metaphor of mosaic can be used to overcome traditional viewpoints and literary studies oriented towards national literatures instead of international literature and to originals instead of all interpretations, including translations, adaptations, and so on. However, it is yet another metaphor. And as any other metaphor, it may also have unwanted connotations. The most important one would be the, the one I mentioned below, which is that all the notions involved, so surface, plaster, mosaic stones, patterns, and images can be interpreted in many ways, including dichotomic and directional views on translation that I was trying to get rid of. Which is why, as a final point, I would say that the potential value of the metaphor of mosaic and translation studies probably is heuristic. By that, I mean it is exploratory, a way of self-discovery, a way of understanding and representing which are the elements involved, rather than a way of making important theoretical or methodological progress. So that's it for me for now. Thank you very much for listening. And I really hope we can meet someday soon in Istanbul or elsewhere. Thank you very much for listening. Bye.